Uh, now, another big story we're covering here today. Uh, doctors apparently should stop telling patients what treatments they should have and should instead set out a range of options and let the people decide for themselves. Mm, the new guidelines have been issued by the Royal College of Surgeons, which says it wants to move away from the culture of doctor knows best. So, what do you think? Do you trust your doctor's advice or do you think you know better? Uh, we're joined now by GP Dr Mona Mansouri and the technology writer Kate Bevan. Uh, good morning to you both. Um, I'll come to you first, Mona. I mean, is this a doctor's worst nightmare? Patients coming in and telling you what's best for them? Well, yes and no. It depends on how that's, that's done, really. Actually, a lot of us have been giving our patients options for quite a long time. In fact, the training I've had has always told us to go through various options and patients can decide whether to follow your advice or not to follow your advice or to pick something else. Uh, and it's, it's good to have that two-way discussion. It's good for people to be educated and to question things uh, and to understand what they're signing up for when they go to the doctor. So actually, I think it's not a bad thing. And I think that if doctors aren't already doing this, then it is something that they should be considering. It's remarkable, Kate, isn't it? The amount of information that's out there now for us as patients um, the on websites. So much, and the problem is there's so much information and it's really hard if you're not an expert, I know pesky experts, to decide what's good information <laughs> and what's bad information. There are an awful lot of charlatans out there uh, flogging snake oil effectively through, through their apps, through their blogs, through their clean eating blogs. And I think it's really hard unless you're incredibly well informed and I'm certainly not well enough informed to be able to sort of say, okay, what is this information here? Where's it coming from? Who's telling it to me? Is it good information can I rely on it or should I actually go and trust a pesky expert it's a good basis though to have to go into your doctor with you know having information to go into the doctor with and explore those options better because often a patient will come to you and it might be something that in that 15 minute window you've got with them you might not have thought of well, well, precisely. I think it's important for us to know what the expectation is of a patient. And it's much better if a patient sort of says to us early on in a consultation, because actually it's about 10 minutes for most GP consultations, uh, that, OK, I've been reading this online and this is what I'm worried about, because it helps us to you know, assess things properly rather than them sitting there worrying about something else or thinking that there's a different treatment that they'd rather have and us not being able to address that. So actually, it is useful. I think there are lots of very good resources out there. But as uh, Kate says, there's also lots of really poor resources out there and it's very hard for a lay person to understand that and to filter out what's good and what's not. Is, is this not just a way of keeping people away from the doctor's surgery because they're overcrowded, there are too many people on their books and they just really want to treat the people who absolutely need that 10 minute appointment, as you said? Well, I think uh, it, the, the, there needs to be a discussion about sort of general education of people about things that are simple and simple advice that and they can one of the use. Things that certain, certainly doctors and doctors' organisations could do is uh, explain how you decide what's useful information and what's not useful information, how to look at the source of information and where it's coming from. And then yeah. as a patient, it's much easier to go, I've had a look at this, I think it's good information, but can you help me with this? Mm. And it's, I think it's still very much a two-way uh, process it has to be. Kate, this is a symptom of the way everything is going now though, isn't it? Everything is moving online, whether it's ordering food, whether it's, you know, doing research for work, whether it's, you know, shopping, everything is going online. Is this just another symptom of that? Yes, it is. I mean, there's so much information online and it's absolutely wonderful to be able to do lots and lots of stuff online, like, you know, order a few prescriptions online, um, order a pizza online. Well, you can now Skype some GPs, can't you? Yeah, yeah I was going to ask you about that because yeah. there are even apps now where you can uh, speak to the doctor directly over your phone. I mean, is that a good idea? And you can sort of show them the symptoms? I think it depends on what you're consulting about. Um, really, at the end of the day, nothing will take the place of a face-to-face -face consultation with an expert who can assess lots of things. So even if it's such as a psychological assessment, actually things like your body language, how you're sitting, your demeanour, your, the way you're dressed, comes into the whole assessment process. And of course, things that are physical symptoms really need to be seen uh, face to face. So yes, for some things you can get advice through those, those Skype or online consultations, but certainly the gold standard is always going to be, for the time being anyway, uh, seeing a health professional in person. Could, could it be more efficient, maybe? Because I go to the doctor sometimes for a 10 minute appointment and I actually only need one minute. I know I've got blisters on my tonsils, like. Sarah Jane had, you know that you need antibiotics, you don't really need the 10 minutes, you just need them to shine a light down your throat and write a script, prescription, or to get a referral. That takes 30 seconds, but you've blocked up that whole appointment. 
Well, yes, and also there are appointments that take longer than 10 minutes, so I think it, it evens out. So yes, there are very quick and easy things that we can do, and certainly those patients we do see quite quickly, but we do need to have that leeway to allow for the appointments that need longer. Uh, again, I'm sort of going back to things like psychiatric assessments, but if someone's come in with, let's just say, suicidal ideation, um, you can't deal with them in 10 minutes. If someone says they're really worried and that they're going to harm themselves, you cannot say, well, that's 10 minutes, off you go out the door. You need to make a full assessment, make appropriate referrals, make an appropriate um, physical or psychological assessment of that patient. And also, I think one of the problems with that is if somebody's come in going, I've got X, the internet tells me I've got X, then you've got to cut through that and find out if they really got X and what's the best way forward if, if not. I think this is pro probably what this is promoting is a healthy dialogue, a discussion mm, yeah. between doctor and patient that perhaps isn't there in some cases at the moment. Okay, uh, Mona, Kate, thank you very much thank for coming in and talking to us about that this morning. Uh, we've still got plenty more to come here on Sunrise.